Exactly what happens within the Fremen realms is a mystery few outsiders experience, let alone survive to share the tale. But today we shall peer beyond the Desert Vale to see how their society functions. From an understanding of their siege infrastructure, their government, their religion, their water customs, and their terraforming initiatives. This is a look into the secrets of the Fremen world. You can explore distant reaches of the galaxy with today's sponsor, Star Trek Fleet Command. It's a 4x mobile strategy game where you have the con to explore the entire Star Trek universe. Choose a faction, customize your ship, staff your crew, and set off on your own path to discover mysteries or engage in real-time combat across an open world. Story arcs help provide context to your journey while enriching the world with famous characters like Kirk, Spock, and Data from all your favorite franchises. Strange New Worlds has arrived in Star Trek Fleet Command, which features Captain Pike and his fellow officers of the USS Enterprise, as well as a new arc which allows players to follow the show's story in-game through weekly episodic missions. The addition of the holodeck building now also allows players the chance to explore past missions and arcs from across the entire Star Trek Fleet Command universe. The game is always evolving, with new abilities, buffs, enemy types, and much more as you adventure out into deep space. Star Trek Fleet Command is available for free on iOS and Android, so download it now using my link below and join the fight. You can also use the promo code WARPSPEED to unlock 10 epic shards of Kirk, enhancing your command instantly. Enjoy! The history of the Fremen is a matter of great dispute, yet there are a few unifying ideas which can be recapped as follows. They originated millennia ago as a fanatical religious sect known as the Zensuni. They wandered the stars as a long persecuted people before ultimately arriving on Arrakis. They consider this to have been a great religious journey whose final step into paradise would come through a cataclysmic end times battle ushered in by a prophesied savior. This moment has yet to arrive, but the signs shall soon herald its coming. Thus have the Fremen cradled this flame of hope for generations, whilst learning to survive on one of the most inhospitable planets in the galaxy. But to understand how this was achieved, we will have to take a closer look at Fremen society and daily life. We can begin with a review of this topic at a high level. In terms of geographic distribution, this is characterized by their habitation of desert villages or sieges scattered across Arrakis. These range in size and level of defenses. But in all cases, their carefully chosen locations provide the necessary protection to survive the harsh conditions of the planet and its imperial masters. While each stronghold is unique, we can nonetheless present a representative model. From the exterior, these will appear as nothing more than rock. Indeed, most sieges have literally burrowed their way into natural formations so as to take advantage of their inherent protection against man and worm. In this way, do they also remain inconspicuous to outsiders. One or more entrances to such sieges may exist. These might be found in the bend of a winding gully, the fissures of a cliff face, or the underside of collapsed boulders. But exactly where they are, and which might be real, false, or simply abandoned is a closely guarded secret. Should one be granted access, however, the point of entry will often give way to a series of winding passages with long-worn stairs. Here the close confines will strictly limit the egress of friend and foe alike, who will be checked by a series of guards and moisture-sealed doors. Such a sight will be intimidating to outsiders, but to the Fremen, the stillness of the air, the faint globe lighting, and the whiff of spice will be their first taste of home. Eventually, the final door will give way to the Sieges' antechamber. Here, water discipline can finally be relaxed and new arrivals can begin to shed their nose plugs, mouth baffles, and cloaks. This is how Paul Atreides described his first experience upon entering Siege Tabor. Quote, The odor of the place assailed me. Unwashed bodies. Distillate ethers of reclaimed wastes. Everywhere, the sour effluvia of humanity, with over it all, a turbulence of spice and spice-like harmonics. 
The interiors of a Siege are deceptively large. As the product of centuries-long habitation, they have gradually wormed their way deep into the rocks with a combination of man-made or naturally occurring tunnels and caverns whose layout defies any standard design. Yet what is common among the Sieges of Arrakis are their assortment of embedded facilities. They are cities, after all, with all the requisite infrastructure to meet the civil and military needs of the Fremen. We can now summarize these briefly. In terms of utilities, a network of machinery ensures that a steady stream of air, water, waste, and power is circulated. External wind traps and dew collectors, for instance, allow for the capture of moisture from the night air. This water is then collected in large catch basins deep underground. From here, it is efficiently piped across the siege in lossless water tubes. Yet wherever it ends up, this moisture will find its way back to the tribe's catch basin. One way or another, all will be reclaimed, be it sweat, urine, or even dead bodies which are processed in specialized death stills. Thus do these reservoirs hold great importance to the Fremen. They represent the literal embodiment of the tribe's life force, containing virtually all the water that has and will ever be recirculated within the closed loop ecosystem of a siege. Power, meanwhile, will also be extracted from the environment by tapping into solar, wind, geothermal, and other natural sources. More traditional generation facilities are also used to provide reliable base load and peak power when needed. In terms of food, some can be grown locally in small gardens, mushroom chambers, and protein vats, while meat and milk is derived from domesticated and wild animals. However, much is imported from the surrounding regions. In terms of housing, Residential areas take the form of small caverns which provide for both communal and private life. A Fremen's personal quarters, or yali, typically measures just a few meters across. Inside may be found a bed, storage space, a work area, and sometimes a small kitchenette or hearth where coffee may be had. Yet sieges provide far more than the bare necessities of survival. Let us now cover these additional features. One major sector is industry. Within a siege, one may find steel suit factories, repair shops, textile chambers, spice processors, waste reclaimers, vehicle bays, fuel cell stations, and more. Cultural centers are also important. This may include schools, meeting halls, temples, and maker sanctuaries. And finally, military installations are quite common. Examples include training grounds, barracks, armories, fuel generators, rocket batteries, flight pads, and sensor arrays. Yet we should also mention that a siege's influence extends beyond its underground layer. In the surrounding area will be found observatories, outposts, refuges, smuggler drops, refueling stations, trade posts, and more. If the conditions are right, a palmary may even be present. Such precious oases in the desert serve as critical research and testing grounds which seek to advance the slow, multi-generational goal of terraforming Arrakis, a dream seeded by the late imperial planetologist Pardo Kynes roughly 75 years prior to the arrival of House Atreides. Zooming out, we see how many hundreds of these 10,000 strong sieges are scattered across Arrakis. Combined with smaller enclaves and groups living in cities, Thufir Hawat estimated their total population at around 10 million. However, such calculations overlooked many hidden communities, especially the far more numerous tribes of the Southern Pole, whose numbers would greatly swell any accurate census. Yet despite their vast numbers, the Fremen remain very much divided. This is in large part due to their relative physical isolation. However, Fremen culture also has much to do with this. Historically, the Fremen have not been without their quarrels. Indeed, intertribal wars and raids have occurred in the past. In more recent years, though, escalating threats from outsiders, and especially the influence of prophetic leaders has done much to foster a common sense of unity, or Ikhwan Bedouin. Yet such ideas only go so far in yoking the fierce independence of a siege, which remains fully autonomous. After all, each Fremen deeply ties their belonging to a singular community. To join one is to find life. To leave one is to embrace death. In terms of social organization, a siege functions as both a great family and a governing body. 
Leading them is a Naib who personifies the ideal virtues of the people and speaks on their behalf. Their authority is supreme. All members of the tribe follow the Naib out of a socially enforced sense of duty without the need for internal policing or system of laws. This dynamic is explained by the leader Stilgar in the following exchange with Paul Atreides and Lady Jessica. Quote, Out here, woman, we carry no paper for contracts. We make no evening promises to be broken at dawn. When a man says a thing, that's the contract. As leader of my people, I've put them in bond to my word. Yet, paradoxically, such power only comes as a result of the Siege's collective consent. Should anyone question a Naib's rule, an Amtal challenge or fight to the death may be issued by any of their followers. To the victor goes the title of ruler. Thus does this system of rule reflect the harshness of Arrakis. Only the strong survive. But even the mightiest of Naibs in their prime recognize the wisdom of good counsel. They are therefore surrounded by a group of advisors whose purpose is to guide rulers in the ways of ancient tradition. While such councils hold little formal authority, they are keys to the stability and continuity of a system which is inherently perpetuated by violent transitions of power. It is therefore before them that Fremen may freely have their voice heard without being seen as directly challenging the Naib. Another important role in the Sitch's government is that of its religious leader, known as the Reverend Mother. To ascend to this position is to have passed the ritual of spice agony. This practice, derived from the Bene Gesserit, will see an initiate consume poison in an attempt to convert it into the water of life. The process is taxing and often deadly. But if successful, it will allow reverend mothers to access the genetic memory of their predecessors. Such religious leaders, therefore, come to represent more than just themselves and hold important sway over matters in Fremen society. Beneath them are junior priestesses, known as Saedina, or friends of God, who will assist in their duties and be prepared to step into their place should a reverend mother perish during or after the spice agony. Together, these spiritual leaders attend to the matters of Fremen religion. This creed is characterized by a blending of ancient Zen and Sunni traditions whose seemingly contradictory nature is made whole by an impassioned faith and appeals to mystery. Layered over this are beliefs seeded by the Missionaria Protectiva and molded by a harsh Arakian life. The former has generated zealous ideas of a great religious journey to be ushered into the end times by the coming of a prophesied savior. The latter, meanwhile, has seen ancient mythology made manifest in the desert environment, such as the reverence of sandworms as the godlike Shai Halud. Beneath these positions, the lower levels of Fremen government, meanwhile, remain rather amorphous. Few institutions exist in much perpetuity, but a few key roles have emerged with some consistency across the sieges of Arrakis on account of their critical nature. One such position is that of Watermaster. As the name implies, they are responsible for overseeing the acquisition, expenditure, and maintenance of this precious resource. Watermasters will therefore spend much of their time enforcing water discipline, conducting regular audits, and maintaining the systems which ensure that so much as a drop is never wasted. Another position is that of Sandmaster. Their duties are twofold. On the one hand, they act as the head of security whilst out in the desert, posting scouts, observing storms or sandworms, and making preparations for attack. On the other hand, they act as the principal superintendent of spice operations, coordinating the work of ornithopters, harvesters, and traders. Thus, with these leaders, their culture, and their sieges, have the Fremen communities survived upon Arrakis for countless generations. In these times, preserving the old ways has been seen as the best shield against the harshness of an indifferent planet. Yet in more recent years, such foundational beliefs have begun to shift. While the arrival of House Atreides would catalyze the radical transformation as a people, there is a preceding event which proved just as important in introducing the reagents for change. This was to be the work of the Imperial Planetologist Pardo Kynes. Around the year 1170 AG, he was exploring the shield wall regions when he came upon a group of Harkonnen soldiers in the act of killing Fremen youths. The planetologist intervened, slaying the assailants and rescuing the boys. 
as thanks for this act he was brought back to their siege. However, the council fell into great discussion over the fate of this off-worlder. True, he was not an immediate threat like the Harkonnen, but who knew what dangers his intrusion may cause? At the very least, he represented a water burden for the tribe, and had gazed upon the forbidden sight of a Chris knife. While discussions raged, Pardo Kynes had enraptured the local children with the findings of his research and its implications for Arrakis. He talked of how Dune once had oceans of water, flowing rivers and liquid rain. His research proved that with just 3% of the existing desert-adapted plants involved in the water cycle, a self-sustaining feedback loop could be induced that would change the face of Arrakis once more. One could walk in the open without a still suit and drink from the manna which fell from the heavens. These were the words of either a madman or a prophet. Yet at this moment, an executioner, dispatched by the siege, approached. What happened next is best recounted by Frank Herbert himself. Quote, the knife man confronted him. Remove yourself, Kynes said, and went on talking about secret wind traps. He brushed past the man. Kynes' back stood open for the ceremonial blow. But what went on in that executioner's mind cannot be known now. Did he finally listen to Kynes and believe? Who knows? But what he did is a matter of record. Uliet was his name, Older List. Uliet walked three paces and deliberately fell on his own knife, thus removing himself. Suicide? Some say Shai Halud moved him. From that incident on, Kynes had but to point saying go there. Entire Fremen tribes went. Men died, women died, children died. But they went. In the aftermath, the planetologist would help direct the Fremen towards a multi-generational goal of terraforming Arrakis. In the process, the disparate tribes were brought together behind a great figure with a grand vision. Upon Kynes' passing, the Fremen were thus primed for another to take his place. In our next episode, we will continue to experience daily life among the sieges by slipping into the shoes of their children to see what it was like to grow up Fremen. We shall then finally explore the pivotal moment of their change with the arrival of House Atreides and its prophecy-fulfilling heir. For now, you can catch script previews, download all our art, and participate in polls by supporting us on Patreon or YouTube memberships. A big thanks to the current supporters for funding the channel and to the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. We couldn't have done it without this team and this community. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe for more content, and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.